and exhort, saying, Save yourselves. So opposite verse 40, we had the constraint. And then opposite verse 41, we had the confession. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And uh, under that uh, 41st verse, we gave you four points concerning the possible meanings of water baptism for the age of Israel. Then we discussed the fact that God, who is the Lord of the harvest, added unto them. It is obvious from the language God was not starting something new here, but rather God is adding to that which was already in existence. We have a similar phrase over again in verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And there, even in that verse, though we did not mention it last week, the word church is not in the original. And even if it is in the original, it doesn't make any difference because we are talking here about the kingdom church rather than the church which is the body of Christ. Now down in verse 42 then, we break new ground tonight with a discussion on the congregation, the kingdom congregation. In verses 42 to 47, we actually see here a foretaste of the kingdom to come. Now before I read that verse of scripture, I would like to uh, read something that I think is of great interest. Occasionally in my study I run upon something that I think uh, will interest you. I know this is not uh, the most interesting way to be taught for a preacher to stand up and then read to you out of a, the notes or out of the pages of a book. But from time to time, uh, it's interesting to find uh, someone, thank God, somebody who agrees with me. And uh, it's of special encouragement, to, especially when you find some of these words within the pages of those who have some knowledge of our dispensational teaching, who have elsewhere criticized us. Some have even gone so far as to call our position of interpreting the Word of God through dispensational principles, heretical. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that we were cultish. So it's a special delight to me to find within the pages of their own writings commentaries on the Scripture that are compatible with what we teach. And quite frankly, I feel that it's an endorsement of the dispensational interpretation of the Scriptures. Now, this happens to be a little booklet written by Dr. M. R. DeHaan. Dr. M. R. DeHaan, of course, uh, in later years, uh, became very antagonistic towards the dispensational interpretation. However, please take note that in commenting upon the very passages that we're going to study and a few comments about the passages we've already studied from verse 37 on, here's what he says. Listen very carefully. After Peter had explained the strange happenings to the assembled crowd, he brings to them the message of the gospel. We suggest you read all of Peter's sermon on the day as recorded in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 56. We would point out three important things about Peter's sermon. Number one, it was addressed to Jews only. It was the gospel message of the kingdom exclusively for the nation of Israel. It was addressed to none other than to Israelites. Now that's good preaching. The entire message was addressed to Israel. And as we shall see, was the offer of the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? From Acts 2 on, it was the offer of the kingdom they had once refused. They are to receive a second offer. And when this too is refused, the gospel goes out into all the Gentile wor world. But the order of Christ's commission was, and he has it here, capital letters, first in Jerusalem and Judea, then to the nation of Israel, then to Samaria, and finally to the uttermost part of the earth. Peter's first sermon was preached in Jerusalem and addressed to ye men of Israel. It was to Jews 
only. Then he comes to Acts 2.38 where we have the conviction. They were pricked in their heart. Notice Peter's answer to their question. What shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized. These two things were the re requisite for the remission of sins and receiving the Holy Ghost. To use this passage for the church today leads to utter confusion. Amen. To apply these words to us today results in the common error of making water baptism a requirement for salvation. That would mean baptismal regeneration, which is a denial of the gospel of salvation by grace. This was not the message of Paul to the Philippian jailer when he cried out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul did not say, Repent and be baptized. But instead he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Philippian jailer was not a Jew, but a Gentile. Notice the use of the pronoun in Acts 2 and the use of the pronoun in Acts 16. At Pentecost, Acts 2, the plural pronoun is used. What shall we do? What must we do as a nation? But in the case of the Philippian jailer, the single person pronoun is used. What must I do to be saved? The reason for Peter's answer, repent and be baptized, was because he was speaking to the very people who had openly rejected Jesus. They must therefore also openly acknowledge and own him as their Messiah. They must repent and manifest this by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? This was not necessary. They already believed in the Father and in the Holy Ghost, but they must now assert their faith in Jesus Christ, whom they had rejected. Baptism was for the Jews. Amen. The offer must first be made to the nation of Israel, and after that the message must go on into Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. If the nation of Israel had received this second offer of the kingdom, their Messiah would have returned. But God knew this offer would also be rejected. So he planned his program for the church after the gospel had been given to the Jew first. I don't know whether you know it or not, but that is good theology. 3,000 souls were added to the church of 120 members, baptized that day in the Holy Spirit. It does not say these 3,000 were baptized into the church, which is the body of Christ, but they were added to the already baptized body of believers. That's uh, Dr. M. R. D. Hahn in Pentecost and after. I have another comment I want to read uh, from a book entitled Whole Bible Studies. Outline and comments by Dr. Warren Wiersbe, uh, pastor, now pastor of the Moody Bible Church, Moody Memorial Church. Concerning Acts 2, 37 through 40, the men were convicted and asked Peter for counsel. Acts 2, 38 is one of the most misinterpreted and misapplied scriptures in the Bible. Peter tells them to repent of their crime and be baptized, identifying themselves with the Christ. This is the same message of John the Baptist. and Jesus. To make baptism essential for salvation than the receiving of the Holy Spirit is to deny the experience of the Gentiles in Acts 10, 44-48. The Jews in Acts 2 received the Spirit when they repented and were baptized. There is no salvation in water, in the waters of baptism. If we rightly divide the word of truth we see these errors clearly. 
Peter states, and this was one of the points that I made, Peter states that the promise of the Spirit was not only to the Jews present in Jerusalem, but also for the Jews scattered abroad. Now, when it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, and to those who are far off, the average commentator says the far off ones are the Gentiles. Dr. Wisby says no, and I agree with him. This cannot refer to Gentiles because the Gentiles did not receive any promises. Now, concerning the multitude, the kingdom congregation that we're going to read about tonight. Note that the believers remained in the temple. The Spirit had given them unity of heart and mind and added believers to the assembly day by day. These verses are a beautiful description of what life will be like during the kingdom age. While the church, meaning the body of Christ, was in existence in the mind of God, meaning in existence in the mind of God in Acts 2, the full revelation of it was not given until the Apostle Paul. Acts 2 is Jewish ground. So do not read into these verses truth that was not revealed until later. The church today does not meet in a Jewish temple, nor is it required to practice communism. The kingdom offer was still open and would be until Acts 7 when the leaders of the nation resist the spirit and kill Stephen. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but that excites me to realize that uh, others, even others who have traditionally found themselves in a different dispensational camp, occasionally stumble onto some truth. And uh, I wholeheartedly say amen to that. I read it for you because I want it to be on the tape. Occasionally, uh, it's interesting to go back and to find out just where you can find some confirmation other than that which you received perhaps or have received over the years from this pulpit. It's good to know that we're not alone. Now, Acts 2, 42. There are four things, first of all, that we see about the kingdom fellowship. And they continued. The word for continued here means they persevered. They kept on keeping on. They did not grow weary. They were instant in season and out of season. They kept at it when they felt like it and they kept at it when they didn't feel like it. They persevered. The very word perseverance implies effort. It implies expenditure. It implies earnest effort. And they continued steadfastly. Now, this is a, a great deal different from what we often see today. And maybe this will challenge all of us to perseverance. I think that sometimes we take our involvement in the things of the Lord all too lightly. Uh, I think sometimes uh, we put aside duty and we do that which is convenient. I hope that you realize by now that our assembly together is not a matter of convenience, it's a matter of duty. We have a duty to gather together into fellowship. It's not for us to choose, shall I come to Bible class? It's not for us to choose, shall I be in Bible study, Sunday school, shall I be in church, shall I be in evening service? The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And I can prove from Scripture that in every age and in every dispensation this was not confined to one specific day. It was daily. We find it in the age of Israel under the dispensation of Moses. They met daily. In fact, they met twice a day for Bible study. 
We find it here. They met daily. The Apostle Paul repeatedly said that daily and from house to house. It's a daily duty. We ought to be in the Word daily. Now, there are times when the body of Christ gets together. We have our own individual fellowship, and we get together then corporately. And it's our duty to be steadfast. It's our duty to persevere. And we see here even these kingdom saints uh, simply did not make a profession. All too often we have somebody make a profession of faith in Christ, and that's it. Somebody comes forward in a meeting. Somebody prays to receive Christ as Savior. They make a profession of faith in Christ. And you've heard the story, and I've heard the story, and I've seen it. And then a few weeks, or perhaps in just a few days, you wonder, well, did they really make a decision? There's no perseverance. Uh, there's no stick to itiveness. There's no steadfastness. All right? My first point. They were steadfast in four things. First of all, they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. And here's one of the reasons why I know that they met daily. It was not a matter of being steadfast in the doctrine that they had already been taught. And the reason for that is because of the Greek word that is used here. The Greek word is didakte, which means the act of teaching. So they were steadfast in the apostles' act of teaching, which meant that the apostles' teaching was a progressive thing. The believer in those days did not get their knowledge of the Bible uh, in a one-shot deal. It was not a Shangri-La. It was not to rub the magic lamp and hocus pocus presto changeo. All of a sudden, uh, God zaps you from heaven with all of the Bible knowledge, and now you're a super spiritual giant. Not so. It wasn't so then, and it's not so now. So the word here for the apostles' teaching or the apostles' doctrine, it means the emphasis is upon the act of, uh, the progressive act, continuing act of teaching. Now, we do not have to wonder what the apostles' doctrine was. For example, all we need to go is back to what we call Israel's Great Commission, not our Great Commission. Now, I don't know whether you know it or not, but Israel had two commissions, one lesser commission and one greater commission. Israel's lesser commission is found in Matthew chapter 10, and Israel's greater commission is found in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I will command you. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have, past tense, commanded you. And all we need to do to find out what the apostles' doctrine was is to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. And there we see the platform for the kingdom. There we see kingdom doctrine. There we see God's word for the kingdom. There we see the emphasis on the kingdom. And this falls in line then with what we call the gospel of the kingdom. We do not have to wonder what they were preaching. Of course, there were some advances even on what we would call uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and so on. There are some advancements. We even know what those are. When it comes to gospel information, even as uh, Dr. DeHaan here in this book has suggested, read word for word Peter's message here on the day of Pentecost. The cross was now an accomplished fact. The Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified. The Jesus of Nazareth had been made now, as we were told, both Lord and Christ. He was now resurrected. God said, sit at my right hand until I make my enemies my footstool. And, of course, the Lord promised that he would come back. So we know it's not a matter of wondering what those apostles taught. What was the apostles' doctrine? We know what it was. It was the gospel. It was the message of God in relationship to his promises to Israel in regard to the kingdom. Now we go on. The second thing that they continued steadfast in was fellowship. And here we have, and there are several words in the Greek language for fellowship. Here we have a very wonderful word, one that we need to learn, and it's called koinonia. And koinonia means 
sharing or participation. I guess it's a famous saying that no man is an island. But there's something in the Bible that's very similar to that. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. And this was especially so in the kingdom context. And we see that later on here in chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And then later on in chapter 4, we find them selling all of their possessions for two reasons. Number one, they were commanded to do it. It was not a sudden thought. It was not just something that they sucked out of the end of their thumb or got from Fluffy Ed's notebook. They got it out of the Old Testament prophets. In anticipation of the kingdom, they were to have a materialistic fast. And the second reason for it was because Jesus himself had prophesied, as well as some of the Old Testament prophets, that Israel was going to have a time called the Great Tribulation. And there would be great, terrible suffering. There would be great poverty. There would be a need for the nation of Israel to have a fasting of materialistic things. And I'm using the word fasting in the sense that God uses it. A doing without materialistic things for the benefit of the overall group. And so we find here fellowship. And the word fellowship, sharing or participating, fits in perfectly with this idea of kingdom communism or kingdom sharing. Now, the difference between this kind of communal living and the kind of communal living of the hippies today and the kind of communal living of the communists is about as uh, different as there is a difference between heaven and hell. There's no relationship. Now, this was a divine, divinely inspired, a divinely taught kind of koinonia, fellowship, sharing. Now, obviously, there has an application for us today. Obviously, we should, in the spirit of the Bible, in fact, the Apostle Paul teaches grace giving. And when we see people in need and when there are those who are without, we ought to be the first, especially towards those who are of the household of faith. Now, we're under no special obligation to give handouts to unbelievers, contrary to what a lot of people think. In fact, a lot of unbelievers are poor. A lot of unbelievers are in straits tonight because they've turned down the gospel, because they've shook a rebellious fist in God's face, and God is disciplining them. Same thing with some of the third world countries today. And we, uh, a lot of people have bleeding hearts, and they say, oh, we ought to feed them, we ought to this, we ought to that. Many of them are in the position and facing the problems they are facing today simply because they're heathen. And because they've turned down the only source that they could have. And that's God. And God is disciplining them. And when God disciplines someone, you and I sure don't want to get in the way. Now, I'm not suggesting that's a hard and fast rule. And I'm sure that there are circumstances and events that ought to dictate certain benevolent activities. But for the most part, our uh, philanthropy... Our benevolent giving ought to be directed towards those who are of the household of faith. Now, we're not commanded to do it. These people had no choice. If they wanted the kingdom, they had to do it. The Bible says, uh, seek those things which are above. Uh, don't seek after the things that the Gentiles seek after. That's what he told the Jews. Uh, the Bible said that uh, if they would seek first the kingdom of God, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promises, then all of these things would be added unto them. That meant that they had to have a proper attitude toward materialistic things in view of God's commandment, in view of the tribulation period. They gave it away and laid it at the apostles' feet. But you and I have no such commandment today. So that's the word koinonia. It certainly has its application to us today, but not in the same sense that it was applied to the nation of Israel. The fourth thing that uh, the apostles here continued steadfastly in and the believers continued steadfastly in was breaking of bread. And the word for breaking of bread here simply means to dine in company. Now, because this is mentioned twice, a little bit later on over here in verse 46, breaking bread from house to house. 
you naturally ask the question, well, why twice? And I believe the answer is that the breaking of bread here in the first instance is different from the breaking of bread in the second instance. For example, in the second instance, we are told, did eat their meat. And the word for meat means food. So I believe that dining in the company of people from house to house, they sat down and had their food. I think that simply means having folks over for supper. But I believe that the first expression, breaking of bread here, refers to the communion. I believe that it refers to the breaking of bread and the drinking of the wine, all, of course, in keeping with the new covenant. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant was made with Israel like the old covenant. And Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And I believe that when they met together, they broke bread. They shared in this memorial feast, not only in memory of Jesus Christ, but in anticipation when he said, I will drink it anew with you in the kingdom. Now, he's never said that to us. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to do it because he received it from the living, resurrected, glorified Lord. So you see, and the reason is because you and I share in as church age believers, members of the body of Christ, we share in the spiritual benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. And that's the reason why the communion or the Lord's table is the only legitimate ceremony, the only legitimate ritual for the church age. And we are to do it, we are to preach his death until he comes back. Then the third or fourth thing now that they continued steadfastly in was in prayers. Now, this is not private prayer. This is prayer meeting. And, uh, of course, we have, even in the church age, uh, obligations that uh, are related to prayer. We're to pray always. Uh, we're also to pray corporately, to pray one for another, to pray for ourselves, uh, the book of Philippians is especially, I think, uh, very enlightening on the subject of prayer. We have just recently studied in Romans chapter 1 the doctrine of prayer. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans had a prayer list. We know that in the 16th chapter of the book of Romans, he mentions 29 people by name that he apparently had on his prayer list. The Apostle Paul was a pr real prayer warrior, and he apparently taught people how to pray. So I want to emphasize the fact that while we have prayer responsibilities and while these people had prayer responsibilities individually, they had prayer responsibility corporately. And on Wednesday night, uh, we get together to have a prayer meeting. I suppose they prayed every day. I suppose that a portion of every meeting was devoted to prayer. But I want you to notice something. This is not the word eratao, which means to ask, but this is a different word. This is a word which means specifically that when they prayed, they prayed to, and you want to mark this down, they prayed to invoke the power of God. And, uh, of course, if you know anything about dispensational truth, you know that the greatest demonstration and display of God's majestic, miraculous working power will be in the tribulation period and in the kingdom yet to come. And in anticipation of that wonderful kingdom, these people are invoking, they're getting together and they're praying, they're invoking the power of God. And I want you to see the result. And of course, there's an application to us. Just as prayer moved the hand of God for them, surely the prayer of, hand of God is moved by prayer in this day. But notice, and they continued steadfast in prayers, they invoked the power of God. And verse 43, the result is, and... Fear came upon every soul. Now, that's exciting. What a wonderful display of God's power. God literally breaking into the everyday happening and events that transpired around this city of Jerusalem. So much so as a result of their prayer that fear, and the word for fear here means outward terror. Think of it. It's very seldom today that we see conviction of sin today. There's hardly any awareness of God's existence today, let alone any awareness of God's power or the terror or the wrath of God. 
Most people live every day unconscious of God's existence. Even believers, for all intents and purposes, many believers are atheistic in their view of life. But when the people here prayed, the fear of God fell upon them, and fear came upon outward terror. It was a conviction. It was a terror that could be seen. By the way, a lot of these words can be investigated even if you don't know one word of Greek. In fact, here in our little church uh, book room, uh, we keep a good supply, although I think we just sold our last one, although we'll be ordering some more. We keep a good supply of Dr. Bullinger's book entitled A Greek Critical Lexicon and Concordance of the Greek New Testament. Every, every English word in your New Testament is recorded in that book. He tells you exactly where to find it. You can read it in the English language, and you can find out the exact meaning, the root meaning. You cannot understand, or he does not give you all of the declensions, the conjugations, the declensions, the verb stems, uh, the, the nouns, uh, the, the voice, the mood, what have you, which, of course, is also necessary uh, for proper interpretation and study. But for the root word, and if you're not using it, you're missing something in your everyday study. So that's, uh, I don't, uh, no commission on that. That's just free information that will help you in your everyday Bible study. I love the writings of Dr. Bullinger. I don't suppose there's, I know there has not been a sermon in five years. There had not been a time that I've ever gone to my Bible that I have not used. I have worn that book out. It's valuable. Uh, I, I could not, uh, and I would not. In fact, I personally think that a preacher is not to be trusted. If your preacher does not know and if he does not use the original Greek languages, I personally don't think you ought to trust him. And uh, uh, so, so, uh, so uh, much a conviction is that of mine that uh, I, uh, I know that the true meaning simply cannot be found in the English translation. And so you need to be using it. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now I think that's an interesting thing. We have no evidence, or very little evidence. There are a few verses of Scripture that can be stretched, and I would not say that was wrong. But uh, we have no real evidence that anybody other than the apostles or those who were very close to the apostles, some of the deacons, ever performed miracle signs and wonders. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. Now, I have uh, taught these two verses of Scripture before, so I'm not going to teach them tonight. But what we have here in verses 44 and 45, and sold their possessions and good and parted them to all men, every man, as every man had need, is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 7, verses 3 through 14. In Zechariah 7, verses 3 through 14, you ought to mark that down in your Bible. Here we have the nation of Israel in captivity. They were out of the kingdom. And the only way they could get back into the kingdom was to have a proper attitude towards worldly possessions and, if necessary, contribute to the needs of the poor. They had to give it away. And when they did that, they would be put back into the kingdom. The captivity would be ended and they would be back in kingdom blessing. So here's the precedent. In Old Testament times, if they did not have a proper attitude towards those who were in need, you might as well forget it. They'll never have kingdom blessing. Then in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 12, again we have the very same principle. And when we begin with verse 8 of that same passage, you'll notice that immediately if they will have a proper attitude towards materialistic things, and I'm suggesting to you that what they did here, selling all of their possessions and laying them at the apostles' feet, was the proper biblical attitude towards materialistic things. Then in verse 8 of Isaiah chapter 58, immediately, you can read it, it's obvious to anybody that immediately God says, I'll give you the kingdom. Your morning will come. 
The covenants will be fulfilled, but not until. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, those who believed were joined together, sold their possessions, cast them at the apostles' feet, and we are told here they had all things in common, and uh, the goods they parted them to all men, every man as had need. Now, this was also the teaching of the Lord Jesus, and is certainly implied, if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verse 21. Luke chapter 12, verse 21. Luke 12, verse 21. If you want to check this out, you'll find out that this is a parable that has to do with the kingdom. In fact, you can see that real good. Right over here in verse 32. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Please notice he says the little flock. What little flock? The little flock, 120 on the day of Pentecost that quickly grew to 3,000 and then 5,000 and 8,000. There's no question as to what we are talking about. So, what is the proper attitude towards materialistic possessions? Now, I think there's an application today. I think that a man, even in the age of grace, if he does not have a proper attitude towards the things of this world, he finds himself out of fellowship and not in a place of blessing. However, there is no, there is no indication that uh, other than the Apostle Paul, as he explained grace giving as the man, as the Lord has prospered him, so let him give. That means those who have a lot ought to give a lot. And those who have nothing, the Bible says if you have nothing, but if you want to give and you have nothing, it's as though you gave everything. Now, how's that for grace? You can't beat that. You'll not find that anywhere in the Bible except in the age of grace. But that wasn't so under the law. Under the law, when it came to giving, the rich and the poor paid the same. It was not prorated on your income. Only in the age of grace. Now, in keeping with this proper attitude of materialistic things, verse 21 of Luke chapter 12. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. Now I think there's, a, there's a, an element here. We have a, the same compatible thing in Colossians. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And we're told there that we do that to set your affections on things above, so that our treasure might be there. Same principle. But then please notice how it is worked out here. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what she shall eat, neither for your body, what she shall put on. The life is more than meat, food, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowl? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? So you see, their attitude towards materialistic things in view of the kingdom was a matter of faith. If you believe God's going to give you the kingdom, then faith says don't worry about it. Seek not that what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful or in mind or double mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after all these things. Do all the nations of the world seek, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, why did they sell everything on the day of Pentecost and let at the apostles' feet answer? 
because it was prophesied, because it was commanded, and then also because of the anticipated tribulation period. Now you go to Matthew 24 and Matthew chapter 25, and there you have the great tribulation, and when you come to Matthew chapter 25, you'll find out that the nation of Israel is judged on the basis of sharing their things with his brethren, Israel. That's the basis of judgment, Matthew chapter 25. How did, you treat the, how did you treat the brethren? And that's all in keeping now with these people who are assembled in the city of Jerusalem. They're being told that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's offered and so on. And so they sold their possessions. Now, and they continue daily. Verse 46, we're going to finish this. They continue daily with one accord, a unanimous mind, no strife, no division, doesn't mean that everybody agreed with everybody, uh, but it does mean that they were not contentious. does not mean that there were not differences of personality and personality conflicts. But they were of one unanimous mind in the temple. Here's no, there's no break here with Israel, Israel's program. The temple apparently was the only place that was large enough to handle the thousands of people now. Breaking bread, dining in company from house to house or home to home, and did eat their meat with gladness. And the word for gladness here is exaltation, and would you believe it, it can be translated dancing. Now, I'm sure that it was not carnal dancing. I'm sure that it was not wicked, sensual, uh, whatever you've got to jungle junk uh, that you see and I'm certain that it wasn't even dancing here but it can be it just means exaltation these people got excited they were excited at the prospect and singleness of heart which means simplicity praising God and the word for praising here means they celebrated God and having favor with all the people and that means that they received from all of the people, including the unbelievers, a gracious disposition. Uh, they were uh, graciously uh, looked upon. And the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, saving souls is God's work in any dispensation, added to, and the word for church here is not there, but I have no objection to it being in there, added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, if you want to compare this with Isaiah 65, please do it. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, and Isaiah 35. And there in those passages, that's only two of many passages in the Old Testament, where we see kingdom conditions uh, similar to this. Uh, kingdom congregations, kingdom, uh, kingdom blessing, similar circumstances. It's just easy to associate this, not with something new, not as many would have us to believe, the church which is the body of Christ being started, but rather it's very, very easy to associate it with that which was not new to the nation of Israel, but rather in anticipation of fulfillment. Let's have a closing word of prayer. <coughs> with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm sure that there's a great deal these passages that would capture our attention, things that we could apply to our own lives. Are we persevering? Are we instant in season and out of season? Do we follow convenience or duty? Are we faithful in the matter of Bible study, fellowship, prayer, Is there power upon our lives? Do we have proper attitudes towards materialistic things? What are we living for? Are we excited? Is there simplicity? Do we celebrate God? And we might even ask the question, what about saving souls? Are we involved? Are we seeing souls saved? If not, what do we do? The answer lies somewhere in our hearts. 
and to lies somewhere in our adjustment to the plan of God. We can't expect God to adjust his plan to us, but we adjust ourselves to the plan of God. Those kind of decisions and applications must be made by the individual. Father, we pray now that thou wilt be pleased to bless us, give us uh, honesty and integrity of heart in making application of the word of God to our life so that the difference might be seen in our lives tomorrow. May people know us to be, be Christians because of our behavior. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.